Hey folks, welcome back. So the Starfleet Battles Marathon continues. Today I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack, and I'm going to talk about a major feature of the game, and show off a few ways that you can integrate it into your SFB gameplay, and talk about who might enjoy it, and what factors may drive you away from it, uh, and that is fighters. So Starfleet Battles, in the beginning, in the very early editions of the game, was basically about battles between, you know, the typical kind of cruisers and frigates and so forth that you would associate with big Starfleet vessels, right? But over time, the game evolved, and the game designers as well are ex-US military and have lots of experience with military doctrine and organization, so over time the game kind of evolved as more players got into it and started thinking about what kind of ships made sense in this Starfleet universe world that they'd created. And so eventually we found the introduction of fighters, small attack shuttles um, that are heavily armed and can flit around the board and uh, fire their ordnance at much larger craft and then go back and dock with their carriers, get repaired, all that sort of stuff. Now they're quite different from the way that fighters work in the real world with ships. You know, a, a modern fighter jet launching from an aircraft carrier is probably 15 to 20 times faster at least than the ship that it's launched from. Whereas in Starfleet battles, they're actually slower than the big ships, and so they perform a very different function. They also don't have horrible ship-killing missiles like you would get in real life that can toast an entire destroyer in one shot. They have smaller weaponry, uh, but they do have a lot of tactical options for using it, um, so they do add an interesting component to the game. Now, the big controversy, of course, for people who want to use fighters in SFB or not, is whether they feel it fits into the atmosphere of the game, and I think a lot of that depends on how much you're devoted to the original series Star Trek base setting on which the SFU comes from. If you're really into that classical Star Trek feel where fighters never really appeared on screen and were not really mentioned, this may not really feel right to you. Nonetheless, I do encourage you to give it a try um, because what I find interesting about having fighters in the game is that, you know, it's entirely optional, right? You don't need to play uh, campaigns or individual battles that feature carriers and lots of fighters and all the drones flying around and everything. But the option is there for you. And it does create a very different feel. And in a way, it's a little bit more Star Wars-y at times. Um, so if you want to get kind of a different extrapolation of space combat in Star Trek, and you don't mind a bit of sort of Babylon 5 Star Wars type aesthetic in your game, um, then it's it's fun to work with. And I find that it doesn't bother me too much, even though I am a longtime Star Trek fan, uh, because I can view the SFU as an alternate history. It's a, it's a different branch, a different timeline where, you know, different races developed and, and the Federation developed in a different way. And so military doctrine evolved differently as well. And with that in the back of my mind, I don't mind so much. Uh, but if you really want to get the feel of what you see on screen in the original series, you may not be into the fighters. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show off what you get in the core fighters-based modules, which you really need to make full use of these in the game. And that is Module J, Captain's Module J, uh, which was recently updated in 2020 by ADB. Um, and then Module J2, which is here, Advanced Fighters. And that particularly brings in new uh, options for heavy fighters and bombers. Now, you don't necessarily need J2. You can get by uh, with just J in a lot of cases. And as per usual, it can be handy to have the master rulebook. So you have all the rules from those modules at your fingertips anyway. But it is useful, I think, to start in a piecemeal fashion if you're thinking about adding a big element like fighters into the game. You know, pick up the module. It's got a nice little SSD book with various useful carriers in it, tons of useful information specifically about fighters. And you build from there and see whether you enjoy it or not. I've also got two more modules in the stack here, which I'm just going to highlight individual ships from. And that's module R2 and module R7, um, which both offer some more options for using fighters that you might find interesting. R2 um, adds a lot for the Federation if they want to use fighters. And module R7 adds battleship carriers and stellar domination ships, which are a lot of fun if you like big star ships. So we'll start off with module J. Now... I have to really commend ADB because in the update in 2020, they really added a ton to the rulebook for this module. You can see it's very thick. Um, and what they've done is they've really brought in almost everything that you really need. In previous editions of this, it would refer to rules that were in other modules or that required a master rulebook or whatever. It was a little bit annoying. It wasn't that self-contained. But now um, the module J rulebook contains really everything you need to know to get started with fighters. Um, it keeps out some of the more complex stuff that's in J2, which is totally sensible, given that, you know, you can look to J2 for that. 
It also has a ton of scenarios. It has a carrier group campaign, which is a lot of fun to play. Um, and it also incorporated a lot of information about all the fighters available for the core empires in the game. Um, so the R section rules are very detailed. Everything's been expanded. Um, so if, even if you have an old version of Module J, I recommend getting the newest one uh, because it really does bring everything together in a really helpful way. Um, now my copy, I'm assuming this is every copy, but I don't remember that my original copy had multiple counter sheets. But we'll start with the counters this time just to show you um, what you get. So uh, you get fighter counters of different types for the Federation, as I'll talk about in a minute. The Federation are a bit unique in their fighter doctrine. They have a lot of options here. So we have F-14 fighters up there. We've got various carriers and escorts uh, on the ship front. Then we've got A-10 fighters, um, and then we've got A-20 heavy fighters, and we've got some generic fighter counters you can use for stuff that's not covered there. We've got some general auxiliary carriers and generic ships and fighters, again, to fill in any gaps if you have lots of fighters on the board and don't have particularly the exact right counters. And we've got Orion fighters and ships. We've got Klingons as well with their ZV fighters and a few carriers and escorts. Then we've got the Romulans with their gladiator fighters and a few helpful plasma torpedo um, counters, which is always helpful. Then we have uh, Tholians and their fighters, a couple of Kazintis. Then we have the Gorn. They actually use Federation fighters, but they have been changed and their names are different, so they do get separate counters. And then we finally have some stuff for the ISC. And we've got a carrier, some ISC fighters, and some more plasma torpedoes. What's helpful though is they've included an extra ammo counter sheet, uh, which is really helpful because when you have lots of fighters on the board, there are going to be a lot of drones and a lot of plasma flying all over the place. So the ammo counter sheet gives you some extras of all that. You got some Kazinti drones, some uh, sort of multi-drone counters here, a few extra shuttles. Same again for the Klingons. You got some extra Hydran fighters because they always tend to have more fighters than anybody else. You got some plasmas for the Gorns. You got drones for the Orions and the uh, Feds. You've got a bunch more plasma torps for the Romulans and the ISC. Um, some extra web counters. It's everything you need basically to help ensure against you running out of counters when you've got lots of seeking weapons and stuff on the board. So uh, really they, they've thought it through with Module J. They've tried to give you enough ingredients that you can play uh, decent carrier on carrier battles of a good size um, and not run out of stuff that you need to run it, which is great. Now, as far as the rule book, I'm not going to go super into detail here, but I'll try and give you a general background of all the stuff that's available. There's really quite a bit at your fingertips in here. Um, if we look at the table of contents, so uh, we got some new combat rules. So we have chaff uh, for fighters. We have internal explosions and shuttle bays. We've got Aegis fire control, um, which is used by escorts to protect carriers. We've got a couple new types of drones. We've got a bunch of new rules under the J section, which is shuttles. And this is all the new stuff you need for fighters, like pilots, dogfighting, uh, new types of shuttles, uh, the SWACs, for example, which are only for Federation. Some stuff about fighter pods, heavy fighters. Then we get into the very detailed R section rules uh, for the general units, Feds, Klingons, Romulans, Kazinti, Gorin, Tholian, Orion, and ISC. Then we've got a bunch of uh, general scenarios, historical scenarios, a monster scenario. We've got uh, two mini campaigns and a carrier group campaign, which, which I mentioned. Uh, both are, All these three things are really fun to play. And then you've got your master fighter chart, which is really handy to have. And you've got data for your carriers, commander's options, all the, the data you need to run fighter-based campaigns. So again, really comprehensive. They did a really great job of bringing it all together in this edition. Um, so I'll just quickly skim through the new rules that you'll, you'll run into that make fighters interesting. So first of all, um, when fighters are targeted by missiles, they have the option to chuck out some chaff. Um, they'll have a limited number of packs of chaff, which are marked on the fighter SSD. And what that does is if you, you roll a die and if you're successful with the roll, all drones and plasma torps targeted on that fighter will lose tracking and disappear. However, there is a flip side to this that when you drop chaff, it interferes with your own ability to fire. So you won't be able to use direct fire weapons or seeking weapons for eight impulses after you use chaff. That may not sound like a big deal, but given that you're under fire and you're you know, obviously desperate to escape if you're using a chaff pod, a savvy opponent will use that eight impulse gap to your disadvantage. So they may stagger the launches of their drones, make sure that one comes in six impulses after you drop your chaff to, to mess you up, you know, things like that that they can do to make use of that window of vulnerability. 
Uh, so it adds an interesting tactical element to fighter versus fighter battles. Um, chain reactions and internal explosion. So this governs what happens if a shuttle box, which contains an armed fighter, is blown up. Then the weapons that are loaded on that fighter can blow up and cause a chain reaction and blow up a bunch of stuff in the shuttle bay. So it's an inducement to use your fighters, get them out of the bay um, and launch them so that they get to use their ordnance before they get blown up in some heinous chain reaction. Um, so it's it's it can be quite devastating if you get hit by a big chain reaction. Then we have the Aegis fire control, which is basically allowing you to kind of fire your weapons one at a time, see how they have worked in your defense and then judge whether to fire more. Normally you have to fire your to, to declare your fire at the same time uh, during a current impulse. But then say you, you fired an enemy fighter and you blew it up right away, then your other fire uh, weapons fire would just shoot off into space. With Aegis, you can make sure that every shot you make counts for something because you can fire, see what happens, then choose whether to fire again after that, even though you're in the same impulse. So it really makes your fire more efficient when you're trying to shoot down fighters and drones and stuff. A lot of escorts have Aegis, and some carriers themselves have Aegis as well. Then we got the new types of drones. So uh, we have Starfish drones, and the Starfish drones are basically uh, a multi-warhead type of drone. Um, but rather than shooting multiple drones off one initial drone, they shoot off anti-drone rounds. Uh, and those are really useful because when you have fighters on the board, you will tend to have lots of drones flying around, and the starfish can allow you to take down three just from firing one drone. But they are uh, limited availability. You've got to pay points for them and all that. Uh, but they are useful to have on board. Then we have the Stingray drone. The Stingray drone is a way to extend the reach of something called a dogfight drone or a Type 6 drone. Uh, the dogfight drones are specialized to shoot down these kind of fighters and small shuttles. Um, they do maximum damage to small craft um, and very little damage to ships. They also are warp seeker drones, so they're not distracted by uh, the, the usual things that could set a drone off its target. Um, you have to use chaff to get rid of them, basically. So they're more expensive to get rid of, and they are better at taking down fighters, but they don't have a long range. So... The Stingray drone allows you to try and take down fighters from afar using your dogfight drones, which is helpful as well. Then we have warp booster packs. Now these are, again, they cost some money, but what they do is allow your shuttles to go much faster. So as I mentioned, fighters and shuttles are slower than ships typically in this game, um, which is kind of counterintuitive if you're used to real world jet fighter type combat. Uh, but you can spend money on things like warp booster packs, which will double the speed of your fighter or shuttle, but it also increases their liability to damage. So there's a, a major disadvantage there. They are more fragile, um, albeit they are much faster. One of the advantages of fighters is despite their lower speed, they're extremely agile. So um, they can make one high energy, high energy turn every turn with no penalty, and they never roll to break down like a ship would. Um, they also have very tight turning modes. So, you know, above, I think, speed 18, their turn mode is only something like three, um, which means they have to go three hexes before they make a turn. Most ships are, are worse off than that at higher speed. So shuttles and fighters are very maneuverable, but getting that higher speed is difficult. You have to invest in things like warp booster packs to get them able to catch up with the faster ships that can go speed 30 or 31. Then we have lots of rules about pilots. So these are useful for the, uh, the mini campaigns and the campaigns in this book. Um, in those cases, you'll want to keep track of which fighters survive a given scenario because you, you know it's a continuous campaign. So you may want to keep track of what your fighters' uh, pilots' experience is like. And as they gain experience, um, they can get promoted and they get better abilities. They're more likely to survive if they get blown up. And there are lots of benefits uh, for dogfighting and things like that, which is a pretty cool element that adds to the campaign. Um, dogfighting itself is actually a really complicated set of rules, which frankly I haven't used that much. So I don't, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about it. But basically this simulates sort of tight furball combat between individual fighters that are in the same hex. Um, and you can use your weapons fire and your pilot abilities and stuff to gain you an advantage in the dogfight. And then you will roll, depending on the, the situation that each fighter is in, and you'll resolve this dogfighting combat uh, to see who comes out alive. So you can see here there's uh, different ways to, to benefit from your advantage in a dogfight. So if a fighter is advantaged, you can fire direct fire weapons, dogfight drones, plasma torpedoes. You can separate 
run away, you can drop chaff, you can do all kinds of stuff to turn the dogfight in your favor. Um, and the degree of advantage also gives you bonuses to your die rolls, makes you more likely to shoot the other fighter down. Um, all fighters on their SSDs, as you'll see later, have a DFR or dogfight rating, um, and that's central to their success in these combat. So if you have a fighter with a low dogfight rating, you want to try and stay out of close-up combat with superiority fighters that tend to have high DFRs. All right, so you can see there's quite a few rules involved, so it does take a little bit to get used to. Um, then we have multi-role shuttles. So these are, you know, a, a typical administrative shuttle on a ship in SFB. Um, it just has one Phaser 3 with a 360 degree firing arc and no other weapons to its name. So typically you'll use them as wild weasels, which is like a, a decoy to draw away opponents seeking weapons, or as a last ditch attempt to do some tiny bit of damage with the Phaser 3 or destroy a drone or something. Multi-role shuttles give you a lot more options. Each race has a different variation of them and they have additional weapons on board. Um, they also have the ability to carry cargo. They can be used for uh, usual suicide shuttle or wild weasel missions. They can also do things like support um, electronic warfare for their hosting ship. Um, so they can loan electronic warfare to fighter squadrons as well, uh, but they are limited in number. Um, the SWAC shuttles, these are a Federation only system. So. In the SFU world, um, when fighters are introduced, the Federation gets really into fighters. They make a whole bunch of different types of them, and they're really good. Um, and then the fighters start to go out of fashion as empires deploy uh, PFs, or fast patrol ships, which are kind of smaller, heavily overweaponed ships um, that use volatile warp engines. They tend to blow up quite quickly, but they do a lot of damage, and they can travel very fast. And they pretty much outclassed fighters. But the Federation did not want to do this. It was a, it was a philosophical objection that they had to putting their experienced pilots into a machine that could blow up at any second. So instead, they, they doubled down on fighters and they introduced new heavy fighters with special functions. And they introduced these SWAC shuttles, which are sophisticated shuttles dedicated to electronic warfare. And electronic warfare in SFB, of course, can help make your fighters harder to hit or give them advantages to hit their opponent. So it makes your fighters more slippery, more difficult to pin down. Um, and because the Federations were the only ones to adopt what they called this third way of, of combat, they're the only ones who have these SWAC shuttles or space warning and control. They're really cool. They have lots of functions that you can use to benefit uh, your fighter squadrons or, or the ships that carry them. Then we have some rules about heavy fighters. So basically, these are fighters that take up more space on a carrier than a regular fighter. So a regular fighter takes up one shuttle box on the SSD effectively, and a heavy fighter will take up two. Um, so that means they have certain limitations about how many can be carried, and they also need to have a specialized carrier with what they call ready racks that can handle the larger fighters and resupply them. There are various types of heavy fighters, which we'll get more into when we start looking at the SSDs. They also have some advantages as far as, you know, they have a little bit better launching rate for their weapons and so forth. Uh, then we have fighter pods. So you can also customize your fighters a little bit besides the warp booster packs, which we already mentioned. You can replace some of their drones, which are kind of on rails on the outside of the fighter. You can replace them with different types of pods that will drop their speed a little bit, but give them some extra abilities. So you can give them electronic warfare pods. Uh, which will help make other uh, fighters in the squadron harder to hit. So we have combat pods here, so you can get more chaff pods to escape seeking weapons. You can get phaser pods that give you an extra phaser three, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is quite useful. Um, you can also get a ground attack pod if you're using your fighters to bombard a planetary base. Um, and you can get a seeking weapon control pod, or two even, uh, which will bolster the fighter's ability to control seeking weapons, and it can also allow them to take over control of another fighter seeking weapons if that fighter needs to go be repaired or something like that. Um, so these pods are really useful. As as always, you know, you need to spend some points, um, but they're not super expensive. So for example, the phaser pod is one point of your total. The ground attack pod is one point. Seeking weapon pods are two points because they are a little bit more useful, generally speaking. Um, then we also have the option of rail launched anti-drones. So instead of uh, carrying type six dogfight drones on your fighters, you can get rid of those and replace them with uh, RALADs, the rail launched anti-drones. And that helps you with drone defense for that fighter. And they can also be used as uh, direct fire weapons during dogfights. Then there's some rules about casual bases, which is more a campaign kind of thing. If you want to set up a casual 
fighter resupply base on a planetoid or a moon or something, this is how you go about doing that. Then there's we're getting into the R section rules. So we start off with uh, general units like planetary bases, um, ground bases for fighters. Then we have the Federation. In this book, uh, we get a few kind of base carriers and auxiliary carriers for the main empires in the game. Um, but really, as I'll show you in the other modules, there is so much more fighter-related content. One thing to notice, when you're bringing a carrier to the battle, like say you want to bring this Federation Heavy Carrier, the CVA, into battle, you will need to check the R-section rules and check the escorts listing down here. So whatever year your scenario is taking place in, it'll tell you what fighters you can carry on that carrier and what, what escorts you can bring along. Uh, and if there are escorts listed here, then you, you have to bring them. So bringing fighters into battle is not something you can do on a whim. Basically, it requires a, a degree of commitment. You have to bring the, the carrier to, to supply them and service them in battle. You need to bring the fighters that are specified. You can't choose whatever you want, depending on the year. And you need to bring the appropriate escorts to make sure that, that uh, you're following the military kind of organization doctrine of that particular empire. You're protecting that carrier effectively. Um, so it's not always, you know, clear that bringing fighters is the best choice, depending on the scenario. So always make sure that you check the lists of escorts and available fighters before you bring something to a scenario. Um, so along with the heavy carrier, we also have various escorts for the feds, um, escort cruiser. We've got light carriers, uh, police carriers, new light carrier. And then we get into the very detailed listing of Federation fighters, which is really helpful um, so it explains what each fighter is specialized for. It specifies things like drone launch rates. Now, the F-14 Tomcat is one of the best fighters in the game. It's very, very good for the Federation because uh, it can launch two, turn, uh, two drones per turn, regardless if they're launched at the same target or not. And it carries a bunch of different drones. So you can see one thing to you'll have to train yourself to recognize is these little symbols that are on a fighter SSD. So these kind of semi-transparent uh, drone markers down here, these little triangles, those indicate type one drone rails. So those are like the typical, you know, anti-ship drones that you would, you would imagine carrying on a ship. Then uh, these black shaded ones are indicating type three drone rails or special rails. So for example, here, if, you, if you're bringing F-14As, it'll say um, it can carry two type three drones on special rails in addition to their other weapons, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, make sure you check your variant in the R section rules, what uh, adjustments have been made to their drone carriage, if there's been any change in launch rates or anything like that. And that'll help inform what kind of tactics you want to use with those fighters. Uh, but the F-14 is a really, really good fighter. Um, they're fast. They have a Gatling phaser, which is fantastic for fighters. Um, and they do have a huge number of available drones and as they go through different refits um, the more of those drone rails become so-called special rails which means you can launch all kinds of stuff so type 3 drones are great because they have atg or the the terminal guidance mechanism where basically once they get within a certain number of hexes of their target they start automatically targeting and you can stop your fighter guiding the missile and launch a new one without taking up another control channel. So those are really useful. But then with other uh, Type 3 drone frames, you can launch things like multi-warhead shots, all kinds of cool stuff. So fighters with special drone rails are really, really flexible. And you know, with eight drone rails on this fighter, you can just chuck loads of stuff on the board at your opponent. The Feds also have the A-10 Warthog, which is a bit exceptional because it only takes up one space. It's not a, it's not a heavy fighter, but it has a ton of hit points compared to other one space fighters and it carries a photon torpedo charge, which is useful if they can get in close. The downside is that they are slow. Uh, they only go speed 10, whereas something like the F-14 will go speed 15 in the in later refits. Um, the A-10 is eventually replaced by the A-20, which is a heavy fighter, and it is much better in terms of speed and, and firepower, but you know there's the trade-offs then and that only certain carriers can bring A-20s to battle. Um, then we have details about the different SWAC shuttles that the feds can use, which nobody else can use, so a big advantage for their fighter doctrine. Um, the F-18 Hornet is by far the most common fighter for the Federation. You'll see those on a lot of SSDs for Federation carriers. Um, and they're pretty okay. I mean, they, they, they travel at a typical speed of 15, like most fighters. They do have uh, six drones and a couple of chaff pods. 
uh, but they're not as exceptional as something like the F-14 or F-15, which do have various advantages. For things like police carriers, you'll often get smaller fighters like the F-4 Phantom, um, which these empty triangles here indicate they have, uh, those are just dogfight drone rails. They can't carry anti-ship drones um, in those two rails. So they're a little bit less flexible. They have a lot less hit points and stuff, but they're still pretty good for you know defending the local home front. Um, here we have the A-20 that I mentioned. You can see it's got now two photons. It's got even more hit points. Um, it has a bunch of anti-drone rounds, six in fact. It has an electronic warfare pod, two chaff, and four Type 3 drone rails. So it's really a lot more powerful than the A-10, but you need that um, heavy fighter capability on your carrier to be able to use them. And also they don't become available until a little while after the A-10 has been fighting for a while. Then we have uh, the F-15 Eagle, which is another great fighter for the Federation. I think you could make a case that either the F-14 or the F-15 is the best one for them for different reasons. Uh, but in both cases, you've got great in-close firepower with the Phaser G um, and lots of drone availability. And again, this one can launch two drones per turn, but they have to be at different targets. Um, so yeah, the F-15 is a really good fighter, but it's, it's not very available. Um, you need to track down. There are only a few carriers that really fly it. Um, a lot of times the F-15s were used on planetary basis for the Federation. Then we got all kinds of other stuff. We've got um, the F-111, which was the Federation's heavy fighter replacement for PFs or fast patrol ships, but you need module K for that one. Um, then we have some more obscure stuff, the A-6 and variants thereof. Then we get into the Klingons and their carriers. Got heavy carriers, light carriers, escorts, escort cruisers. And again, a really nice detailed look at the Klingon fighters. So what you'll typically see on a Klingon SSD uh, will be the ZY fighter series. Um, and in particular, this guy, the ZYC. Um, the Klingon fighters, there are two main variations um, in that they either focus on drone deployment like the ZYC. You can see it has uh, four type one drone rails and two type three. So it's a decent amount of drone throwing it can do. Um, or you have the ZD fighters, which have disruptor charges and anti-fighter drones, the dogfight drones. So they are generally worse than the drone-based fighters. Drones are so flexible that they're just fantastic as a fighter weapon. It allows you to take any given fighter and specialize it um, to a pretty high degree. Whereas disruptors or other ki kinds of heavy weapons like photons, they have limited uses and uh, they're not quite nearly so flexible as drones. Yep, and then we have a little bit more obscure fighters for the Klingons as well. Then we get into our first set of plasma-using uh, fighter races, the Romulans. So here we have, again, a couple of uh, types of carriers for them, various escorts, heavy carriers, command cruisers. And then we get into their Gladiator family of fighters. So their first one here is the Gladiator 1. Now, again, you'll need to learn to recognize the little symbols here. So uh, you will see, of course, that the we have a new symbol here for the Federations. That symbol of a, a circle inside a square represents a photon. For the plasma races, that represents a plasma F charge. It's a one-shot plasma F torpedo. Um, they also have chaff, EW pods. Those are the same symbols that you've seen before. Um, but we also have some new ones for the plasma guys. So these little uh, joystick-looking things here, <laughs> those are plasma Ds. So those are kind of the closest equivalent to drones for the plasma races, but much less flexible. So basically, you you will get mostly plasma Ds for the Romulans. There are some variants that use plasma Ks, although I'm not sure that they're actually in this product. And here we have a useful SSD for a generic carrier, an auxiliary carrier. So you can insert the right phaser table for the Empire that's using it and secondary weapon. Um, but you'll also find specialized Empire-specific auxiliary carriers in the SSD book. Then we get into the Gazintis. So uh, these guys, they have a family of fighters that are variations on the name Attack Shuttle, basically. Um, so as they go over time and get developed, you will see that in typical Gazinti style, we get more and more and more drones, right? So we move on to... Uh, the tactically advanced drone shuttle, and now we have six drones here. Um, the TADSC, tactically advanced drone shuttle C, is virtually the most common fighter SSD that you'll see on Kazinti carrier SSDs. 
Um, you can see it has a couple of Type 3 drone rails and some Type 1s. A generally useful fighter. Uh, I would say it's not up there with something like the F-14, but it's pretty good at what it does. And when flying amidst a cloud of drones launched by your Kazinti carriers and escorts, it can still be very threatening. Then we have a double space fighter for them, a heavy fighter, which has a couple of, of sets of dogfight drones and four disruptor charges. So this is a bit more of a better deal than the Klingons um, in this case because they have the disruptor charges, uh, but they also have dogfight drones for defense against other fighters, and they have a, a decent selection of Type 1 and Type 3 drone rails as well. So uh, more flexible than uh, the typical disruptor fighter that you'll see for some of the other races. Then we have the Gorns, so we're back to Plasma again. We have a bunch of escorts and carriers for them. And then these fighters, you can see they look very similar to the Federation F-18, and that's because the Gorn bought their fighters from the Federation, um, but they are actually too big to pilot the fighters themselves. So they control a planet called uh, Scolios, and they use uh, Scolian mercenaries to fly their fighters because they are physically smaller. <laughs> and you can see as well that, so the F-18 becomes the G-18 for Gorn, and they've replaced the drones with a couple of Plasma D rails instead of the Federation style of drones. Um, the G18D is one of the better versions because it has four Plasma Ds and two chaff pods. Makes it a bit more survivable. Uh, they also adopted other Federation fighters like the uh, G10. Um, oh, and you can see is, here is a, an example of a Plasma K variant. So these little joystick symbols that are filled in on the top, that represents a Plasma K. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to interpret these diagrams. Um, their version of the A-20 fighter is called the G-30, and that uses plasma F charges instead of photons and plasma Ds instead of drones, as you would expect. Um, their most favored fighter is the G-12, which was actually um, was commissioned for the Federation uh, by some contractor, but then uh, the Federation decided not to go ahead with it, and the Gorns uh, picked it up because it was faster than their previous fighters. Um, these guys can have uh, four Plasma Ds or a mix of Plasma Ds and Plasma Ks, which is quite useful. Then we have our friends, the Tholians. Now, the Tholians are good at building small craft, um, like their frigates and patrol corvettes are, are pretty strong um, for a low point value. And, of course, they have web to kind of make everything more difficult to hit. Um, but their fighters are not the best, and that's because they're, they're pretty basic. Um, but the, the advantage they do have is that they have a lot of hit points. So the most typical fighter that you will see on a Tholian carrier is either the Spider 2 or the Spider 3 or some combination thereof. Um, the Spider 2 has a couple of disruptor charges and a Phaser 3 plus a chaff pack. The Spider 3 loses the disruptors, gains another Phaser, and has two chaff pods. So the Spider 3s, I would say, are a little bit more useful. You know, the disruptors are nice to have, but they are just kind of one shot each, whereas um, having that repeated double Phaser shot in a turn is, is a bit more useful for a fighter. Um, and they do have, both of them have 14 hit points, which is more than usual for a one space fighter. The Tholian heavy fighters are actually significantly better. Um, they have additional hit points, of course, and they combine a bit more phaser firepower with having some heavy weapons charges as well. And you have the option of either disruptors or photon charges, which is great to have that uh, decision. You know, it gives you a little bit more tactical flexibility. Um, and then there's their electronic warfare fighter and their Spider 2P Phaser Fighter, um, which unfortunately is not that common, but it is a useful variation of the Spider 2. Then we have the Orions. Their section is very short because they basically buy fighters from other people. Um, and then we have the ISC, so more Plasma Fighters. And uh, yeah, these guys, they can also get some uh, Plasma Fs as well and Plasma Ds. So uh, there's not a huge amount of difference between the different plasma races fighters in, in terms of that because they don't use drones um, and they're not able to turn their plasmas into bolts or shotguns or any of the other weird types of plasma shots um, they're more straightforward but it's also harder to get serious damage against ships with them because ships can outrun the plasma and plasma f and plasma d doesn't last that long on the map uh, drones are a much longer lasting threat but Nevertheless, they are a great force, force multiplier, as any fighter is, um, and if you work carefully with the limitations that you have and use your plasma F charges effectively, then you can, you can still do some damage with these guys. Now we get into the scenarios, which I won't talk about in detail. Um, there's a lot of them, a lot of fun stuff to do, and uh, 
yeah, then some of the scenarios, they actually give you some SSDs here for the things you'll be fighting on ground bases and stuff like that. Then we have a carrier duel scenario, which is actually a, a mini kind of campaign. And then we have the carrier group campaign, which is really fun. Uh, I know some people online who pretty much play repeated carrier campaigns over and over again because they're just a lot of fun. Um, so you keep track of your pilots and replacements and your escorts and all sorts of stuff. So there's there's going to be bookkeeping like any campaign, but uh, but it's a lot of fun. So definitely recommend it. And then you've got all your um, master fighter chart stuff here, which is very useful to have. So that's your master ship chart. And then this is your fighter chart. Yeah. Uh, so this gives you all the basic info you need at a glance. So the size of your fighter, speed, phaser armament, if it has any drones, how much damage it can take. Any other weapons, uh, the basic point value of the year in service, uh, the dogfight rating, which product in, in it's published in, um, and then rules reference as well. So really handy to have that stuff. If you want the full kind of reference for, for fighters, you want to look at module G3, which has um, the master ship chart for basically everything, although I don't think the very latest products are included in that. Okay, so now we'll have a quick flick through the SSDs. There's only, I think, 47 in, in the base J product, which doesn't sound like a lot, but these, because of the nature of these carriers, playing a game with a carrier tends to be long-winded because you've got a lot of stuff on the board, a lot of stuff going on. So uh, you actually don't need that many to get started and have plenty of hours of play time. So, and there are some great ships in here to get started and that are usable for the mini campaigns and the carrier campaign. So we have, for example, the ISC heavy carrier. Um, you can see that it has two squadrons here. A typical fighter squadron in SFB is 12 fighters and usually you'll want one of them uh, to be an electronic warfare fighter. Like in this squadron here at the bottom, we have one with two electronic warfare pods. And uh, we have a few different variants of ISC fighters available. So some of them have, as you can see, plasma Ks. Some of them have uh, multiple plasma Ds instead. So it gives you a little bit of options to mix up um, your anti-fighter defense and which uh, weapons you use against ships. Then we've got a whole bunch of auxiliary carrier SSDs. So here's a, a general carrier for the feds with a squadron of F-18s. And we've got another uh, large auxiliary carrier with two squadrons for the Federation. A small one for the Klingons with a couple of uh, squadrons, ZYCs. And a large one with 24 fighters, as you would expect. Then we have another auxiliary carrier for the Romulans. And these are Gladiator Ds, so they have uh, four Plasma D racks per fighter. Then we've got the large equivalent, and again, we've got a small and large carrier auxiliary for the Kazintis with uh, TAD SC fighters, which as I mentioned are the most common ones you see because they have the greatest drone throw weight, as players would call it. There's the large version up here. Same again for the Gorn, and you can see they've got the most favored G12D fighters. Um, they've got four Plasma Ds on each, plus a couple of chaff pods, um, and they go speed 15, so they're on the faster end. And then the heavy auxiliary carrier or large auxiliary carrier. And again, we got the Tholians. Here they're using Spider 3s in this one, so no disruptor charges for these guys. And then the large carrier for the Tholians, again with Spider 3s. Then our buddies, the Hydrons, with their classic Stinger 2. Now, the Stinger 2, despite the fact this product gives everybody fighters, um, the Stinger 2s remain kind of in class above in many cases because. They have these fusion charges, which are better at close range, but if you fire two charges at once, you can fire them up to 10 hexes away. Now, if you have a whole squadron of Stinger 2s firing long distance fusions from 10 hexes, you can do an awful lot of damage. So Hydran fighters are threatening up close because they got Gatling phasers and they got the fusions and they're threatening from farther away than most fighters uh, because they can do that reasonably scary fusion damage. Then we have the Hydrant Large Carrier, which just has a whole bunch of Stinger 2s. Then we have the Lyrans. Now they have bought the Klingon Fighters, so they're using the ZYCs here. And again, ZYCs in their large auxiliary. And we have the ISCs with the FDF and FEK Fighters. Um, so these are using the Plasma d racks. And then we've got their large auxiliary with 24 fighters. And then we get into the more specialized carrier craft. So the feds get the CVA, um, which is a heavy carrier, and we get a squadron of A-10s. So these, as I said, are still single space fighters. They only take up one 
shuttle box, but they do have uh, a lot more hit points. They've got 16 hit points for a small fighter, which is a lot. They don't have a lot of drones, but they do have a photon. Uh, as I said, the big drawback is the speed, uh, which is only 10, as you can see there. Then we've got the wonderful F-14D, which is a great companion to these guys. So it goes speed 15. It's got a high dogfighter rating of 4. It's got a phaser G, so a Gatling phaser with 4 shots. And then it's got 8 uh, drone rails, which is fantastic, plus 2 chaff pods. So they're really, really excellent fighters, the F-14s. They're relatively rare, so if you're looking to build a carrier battle, battle force in SFB, try and uh, gather up some carriers that have F-14s and F-15s would be my advice. Then we've got some escorts. Um, they have full Aegis, which as I said is very useful for defense. They've also got uh, phaser Gs, which means they have a lot of shots that they can use to defend their carriers. They can also fire their own uh, photons and drones, so they're pretty well armed. Um, we have an escort cruiser here as well, which uses the classic cruiser design, which means it has a little bit of armor as well. Um, phaser Gatlings again to use with your Aegis, and it's got several drone racks also. So again, good for your carrier battle force. Then we have a light carrier, which uh, only has six fighters on it, which are F-18s, the, the, the more common fighter for the feds. But it does have four special sensors, which is great. Um, help keep your the air clear of drones around your carriers and, uh, and your fighters as well. Then we have a police carrier, which again is carrying F-18s. Uh, pretty lightly armed, just with one photon and a few phasers. Then we have a new light carrier. This one carries a squadron of F-18Cs, which have, of course, the two Phaser 3s and six drone racks. Then we get into the Klingons. So we've got an E-4 and E-4R carrier escort. So these are another uh, useful Aegis escort. They've got um, anti-drone devices in multiples. It's very useful to defend against enemy drone waves aimed at your carriers. Then we have the big old C-8V heavy carrier, which is a pretty monstrous beast. Um, it's 235 points, so it's a biggie. And we have a mixture here. We've got some disruptor arm fighters here, and we've got the ZYC, our old buddies, with lots of drones uh, here in, in for the other 18 fighters. Then we've got another escort with full Aegis, again with lots of ADDs and uh, a bunch of Phaser 3s. Actually, are there ADDs? No, it looks like these are uh, leaning on a lot of Phaser 3s instead for defense. And uh, you can also give it a K refit, I believe. Yeah, Phaser 2s mark K are Phaser 1s on the ADS. So, yeah, if you get the ADS variant, then your Phaser 2 Ks, like here and here, become Phaser 1s, which gives you more added flexibility and more offensive power. Then we've got the F-5V light carrier, which is, again, a smaller craft with uh, just eight ZYC fighters on this guy, so not even a full squadron, actually. Then we have our friends, the Romulans. They have a light carrier with only five Gladiator Ds, so they're not um, quite so packed full of small craft as some of the other races are. Uh, the Sparrowhawk B, however, is a bit more beefy, so we have 16 fighters here. Um, and these are a mixture of, what do we got here? We got Gladiator Ds with four Plasma Ds on each and Gladiator 3Ks, which have Plasma K torpedoes instead. Yeah, relatively affordable at 125 points, but not much in the way of offensive weaponry. We do have some Phaser 1s and Phaser 3s up front. We got two Plasma Fs and a Plasma G, so not too bad, but we don't have the big threatening Plasmas like uh, no Plasma Rs. Here we have the Skyhawk B light carrier with uh, eight Gladiator Ds. And then we've got some Skyhawk escorts. So again, um, you can get the uh, limited Aegis or the full Aegis version. Um, both of them, of course, are Romulan, so they have cloaking devices. And these guys, um, you've got Plasma Ds, Phaser 3s for defensive fire, and you've got some Plasma Fs as well. Then we've got a heavy carrier, which, uh, let's see, what do we got here? Looks like two full squadrons of 24 fighters. Again, some of them are Gladiator 3Ks with Plasma K torpedoes, and some are Gladiator Ds. So, uh, helpful to have both variants on board. And finally, for the Romulans, we have a Command Cruiser. Um, good for building your squadrons, since it'll have... The Command Cruisers will have a higher command rating, uh, in this case a 9. And we have eight fighters on board as well, um, and two of them, or four of them rather, are uh, carrying D torpedoes and four carrying plasma Ks. 
Now the Kazintis, we've got a big old heavy carrier to start for them, 215 points. We've got a whole bunch of TAT SCs. Um, looks like we've got 18 of those. And then we have six of the DASC fighters, the Disruptor Armed Fighters. Uh, so pretty decent assortment for them, and it's a pretty beastly ship as well. We've got uh, quite a few Phaser 1s and six drone racks. And... Uh, as a typical for a larger Kazinti vessel, it can control 12 seeking weapons rather than the typical 6. So very useful for a ship of this type. Then we have a carrier tug. Um, so here it's using sort of fighter pods to serve uh, as room and resupply for its fighters. And again, we've got TAD SCs here. It's a tug, so it's not as maneuverable, um, but you know, it's a useful thing to have potentially during a campaign. And we've got a basic Gorn carrier. Got a mixture of G12s and G10K, um, which are kind of the Gorn purchased A10s from federations that use plasma Ks and have a single plasma F charge. And the G12s, of course, are the faster fighters at speed 15 um, with multiple plasma Ds to their name. Then we've got, oops, getting towards the end here, a destroyer escort. Again, you have the option of limited or full Aegis, depending on your points budget. And here you've got some Plasma D racks for more defensive use, but you've also got a big old Plasma G, which is helpful. Um, and then we have an Escort Cruiser, again, in two variations. Um, rather than a Plasma G, we have two Plasma S launchers, and we do have those Plasma D racks as well. Then we have... One more escort for the Gorns, um, and we're back to Plasma Gs and Plasma Ks, it looks like. Yeah, so this is a destroyer escort, a little bit smaller, but pretty packed with, with reasonable weapons. And now finally our friends, the Tholians, they have a Black Widow carrier, um, which just carries a small group of six uh, spider fighters. Four of them are Spider 3s, then we got three Spider 2s and a Spider E with electronic warfare pods. Then we have the more hefty heavy carrier. In module R4T, there's a, a subversion of this that has ready racks for heavy fighters as well, which, I, as I said, are better for the Tholians. The Spider 5 in particular is a better fighter for them. Um, these guys are not great, but they at least can absorb quite a bit of damage. Um, then we have a patrol corvette, which includes Aegis capability and a bunch of phaser armaments, so it can help defend your Black Widow carriers. Then another war escort cruiser, again with Aegis capability and more heavily armed as well. Then we have our friends, the Orions. Um, so they've got two ships in here. This one uses TAD SC fighters from the Kazintis. And then here we have a strike carrier, which is using ZYC fighters from the Klingons. So as you can see, you've got a whole bunch of different... Uh, you got the generic kind of auxiliary carriers for every major empire that's covered in this product. Then you have specific heavy light carriers and a bunch of escorts. Um, more than enough to get you started in the game with fighters. See if you like it. I would definitely recommend trying the mini campaigns and the uh, the larger carrier campaign as well. They're a lot of fun. Keep a track of your pilots. You know, you get attached to them. You can give them names and, you know, your aces will survive and get tougher and tougher. It's a lot of fun to do. And it'll really give you a sense of whether the fighter game in SFB is for you or not. And it, it's really hard to tell in advance, um, it, you know, unless you have a deep philosophical objection to them or, uh, you know, if they instantly appeal to you. I think really the only way to tell is just to try and, and play the game with fighters and see what you think. Now, um, we've already talked for a bunch of time, but I also wanted to introduce you to uh, the J2 Advanced Fighters module. So... This one adds a bunch of new options to the fighter game. So you get some carriers that offer oversized fighter squadrons, allow you to go over the kind of deployment limits for fighters in a scenario. You've got um, scout carriers and area control ships that are, are pretty beastly variants of carriers. Um, then you've got bombers, which are can only be based on planets, which is kind of disappointing in a way, but uh, they're huge fighters covered with weapons and drones. You can buy mega fighters, which are faster and get a little bit of extra survivability. You can use remote controlled fighters um, that don't have pilots, but they also have a shorter range. However, they can launch loads of drones at once. Um, you've got new versions of shuttles, fighters, and plasma fighters, new weapons, Andromedan stuff, loads of, loads of content in here. Um, not everything in here is going to be to your taste, of course. It depends on how much you want to use your fighter options in the game. 
um, but you can see there's quite a bit of stuff in here as well. This rule book is still the 2002 version. I just bought this copy again uh, very recently, so this is this is brand new. But I think given the huge update that was done to module K or module J rather, that that plus this will be more than good enough to get you through um, pretty much any options you need to play with fighters. Um, you probably won't need to dip into the master rule book just yet to use everything that's in this product anyway. Um, so it adds uh, bombers for the Goran Stolians, Kazinti's Hydrons. We've got new seeking weapons, Stonefish drones, Type H drones, Type K plasmas. Um, we've got drogues, which allow you to drag uh, different things behind your ship on a tractor beam. We've got Andromedan small support units. And then we've got the specific rules for fighters, remote control fighters, mega fighters, advanced shuttles, um, shuttle towing rules. And then we've got all of our R section rules and a bunch of scenarios, but there's no um, campaigns in this one. Uh, but you could easily use the stuff in here in the campaigns outlined in module J. So a lot of the stuff in here is getting pretty sort of into the weeds, so I don't want to talk about it too much. Type H drones are, are big drones. Type K plasma torpedoes are better at hitting small targets than large ones. And you'll see, you've seen already that a bunch of the plasma based fighters have plasma Ks available, or at least have variants with those. Here's an example of what bombers look like. So these are Gorn bomber squadrons. You can see they are really huge. Um, here they have a couple of plasma F charges, a bunch of plasma Ds, um, and a ton of hit points. And, uh, you know, they start out slow at speed six, but as the years go by, they get faster up until the more typical fighter speed of 15. Um, but the major limitation of these guys, even though, you know, they're, they're very heavily armed, they've got loads of hit points and stuff, um, they can only operate from ground bases. The only exceptions are the Andromedans, if you're using the um, sort of conjectural rules for fighters that they use in module C3A. But more about that in some future video. Um, the Andromedans, however, do get some stuff here in J2. They get some small weapons platforms and support units that can do some useful stuff. However, they are really not great against fighters and they're not very good compared to PFs. So they're a little bit kind of an in-between solution. Um, if you want to have fun with fighters and then the Andros, I recommend getting module C3A at any rate. Um, then we have our rules about bomber operations. So it talks about their limitations, where they can be deployed. Um, they have an additional layer of damage. So fighters can either be crippled or destroyed. Uh, crippled fighters lose the ability to do lots of stuff. Um, bombers, however, can be degraded, then crippled, then destroyed. So degraded bombers, um, they lose the uh, some of their speed. Um, they lose half of all their non-phaser weapons by type. Uh, various different things sort of uh, blow up once they get uh, degraded. But they can be, of course, repaired if you bring them back to their base. Um, then we have the rules for remote controlled fighters. These, basically, they can really present a problem in certain scenarios when you have uh, races with fighters with a lot of drones, like the Federation's. Um, so they have a limited range. They can only be within 35 hexes of their carrier. But the big thing that they can do, a remote control fighter can launch basically all their drones at once. Um, but the, the flip side of that is the drones will not necessarily have enough control channels. So you'll need to have your um, scouts or carriers kind of contribute um, to actually track those drones to their destination. Unless they have a bunch of Type 3s that can sort of be fired ballistically and pick up a target later or something like that. Some people don't use remote control fighters because they feel they kind of overpower fighters with drones. And I think there's a reasonable argument for that. Then we have mega fighters. So these were an attempt by different empires to keep pace with the fast patrol ships in when they wanted to keep using fighters instead. Basically, if you add a mega fighter pack onto your fighters, you pay a bunch more BPV for it. Um, but the speed doubles and it gains some additional weaponry and some additional damage. And so these rules list what additional weapons you get depending on the Empire, which has purchased the Mega Fighter packs. Um, the Federation, because they don't use PFs, they get some uh, the ability to use more Mega Fighter packs than the other Empires do. So that's quite a useful thing for them to keep up with the Joneses. Um, then we have some more rules on shuttles towing other shuttles, which is really not something I've ever needed to use, but it's good that the rules are there. Then we have our R section rules. So we've got general stuff. We've got some new types of shuttles, um, advanced freight shuttles, advanced admin shuttles, etc., etc. Then for the Federation, we've got some new fast carriers and the interdiction carrier, which has the oversized squadrons of 24 fighters. Um, and because of the rules in scenario deployments, the Federation can use these carriers with oversized squadrons to carry up to 60 fighters in one fleet. 
Um, everybody else is limited to, I believe, uh, 36 at the most, or 48 in some circumstances. So they can carry way more fighters than the other empires. And again, that's kind of because they've gone down this route of using fighters and heavy fighters instead of PFs, they get these kind of bonuses. Um, they also have the patrol carrier, which has a slightly oversized squadron of 18. Then we've got various escorts and the F-111 carriers. So the F-111 was their heavy fighter that sort of took the place of the PFs for them. Um, then we've got various bombers, um, which you'll see once we get to the SSDs. Then we have our friends, the Klingons, and they also have uh, some useful carriers like the area control ship that includes uh, 18 fighters. We've got the interdiction carrier in their version with 24 fighters in an oversized squadron and the patrol carrier. You'll notice a theme, all the, all the races that can um, get some variants of these uh, carriers with interdiction or patrol versions um, so for example the Kazintis get those as well the the interdiction carrier and patrol carrier they also have an area control ship like the Klingons they also have a scout carrier and they get a few bombers as well then we have the Gorn they also get interdiction and patrol carriers with oversized squadrons and different types of bombers which we've already seen in fact then we have Tholians. They get a uh, Dreadnought Carrier, a Dreadnought Space Control Ship, which has uh, two smaller squadrons of spiders, the Tholian War Carrier. Um, they've got various escorts and strike carriers. And here are the SSDs for some Tholian bombers. Again, not super great for the Tholians. They do have a lot of hit points, which is great. Um, they have two Phaser 2s to the front and two Phaser 3s to the rear. For the Spider H and six disruptor charges, the Spider HP replaces the disruptors with photons, which is again a nice option to have. Um, everything else is the same, but notice that the speed is a little bit slow at 12, um, so not not super great. But they are very robust; they can they can definitely take a beating. Then we have the Hydrans, uh, so they get some new carriers. I really like the Lord Executioner area control ship. It's got a whole load of of good fighters on it, including a couple of stingers with hellbores as well as the regular Stinger 2s and the Stinger T, which is a heavy fighter. Um, so a great mix of stuff that's very threatening for your opponent. Then you've got some uh, Pegasus carriers for them and some new fighters. So you've got the Stinger T heavy fighter, the Spike 1 bomber, all the way up to the Spike H heavy bomber, which is pretty cool. Um, then for the Andromedans, we have their mobile weapons platforms. Here's an example here. This is a mine variant. So you can see they're more like a small ship, they're more like a PF, but they're uh, significantly less robust than a typical PF. Um, but the Andromedas can cap carry a whole bunch of these and teleport them using their advanced transporter technology um, you know, into and out of their satellite ships. So they're very flexible in that way. Then we have our cat-based friends, the Lyrans. They have uh, patrol carriers, interdiction carrier, scout carrier, as we've seen with most other races in this product. Um, again, for the ISC, we have Interdiction Carrier, Area Control Ship, Patrol Carrier, Scout Carrier. Um, then we have some new carriers for the Orions as well. Um, note that their fighters here, you know, they, they use a little bit different rules because they're buying up fighters from other empires. Then we have the Wind Cluster. Just a short section for them. They do get some bombers. And the Saltorians, they get some uh, carriers as well. And I believe, yeah, they're using ZYC fighters uh, from the Klingons. And then we have our scenarios. Um, we have, as well, some extra SSDs in there. What were those? Ah, yes, we have Kazinti bomber squadrons. You can see in typical Kazinti style, um, they have a, some disruptor charges and a whole load of drones. In particular... Uh, the Kazinti Heavy Bombers have 12 drone rails, which is a whole lot, plus 6 disruptor charges, plus a whole bunch of hit points. And they're moving speed 15, but look at that BPV, it's quite significant. Uh, and again, they have the limitation of all bombers that they have to be based only on a ground base, um, unless they are Andromedans with advanced transporters. And then we have the SSDs for our friends, the Hydrans Bombers, the SK-1. Um, so the very slow speed 6 bomber, all the way up to the threatening... Um, SK-3 and SK-8, which are both speed 15, um, and they carry what you would expect, namely fusion charges, a couple of hellbore charges, um, and a whole lot of hit points. They're very scary as far as bombers go. That's the rule book.
Um, the counters are no great surprise. You get a mixture of uh, ammo and carrier and fighter and bomber counters here. So for the feds, we get their new carriers, some drone swarms, auxiliary carriers, bombers, um, some of their planet-based F-7 fighters, some drogues. Um, for the Orions, we get much the same. For the Gazintis, we get their new carriers and some generic bomber counters. And the Gorin as well get their bombers and some extra plasma counters. Um, the LDR, the Lyran Democratic Republic, they get some fighter counters as well. Tholians get their carriers. Um, the Klingons get some bombers and carriers. Thol not a lot for the Tholians in here. Um, a few bombers for the Romulans. Um, bombers as well for the ISC. And the Lyrans. Uh, in the wind, they get share this row here. And then our friends, the Hydrans, um, they get a few dribs and drabs here. And then just a whole bunch of mobile weapon platform counters and SSU counters for the Andros. So pretty much not surprising if you uh, glanced at the back of the product what counters you're going to get. Um, again, if you are going to do big carrier battles, though, I think you would probably want to get an extra one of these. So we have a bigger SSD book in this one. We've got 80 SSDs, so I'm not going to cover everything here. But uh, I'll just show you a few examples and again, we'll focus on the feds because um, I think, you know, if you're watching this and you feel a, a deep revulsion about the Federation using lots of fighters, then that might indicate to you not to buy these parts of the SFB system. If you find that it looks fun and that the fact that they have so many options for fighters sounds pretty cool, then, you know, it might be an indication that you want to go forward with it. Um, but as I showed you as well, a lot of the empires have uh, very similar carriers with similar roles in this product. There are quite a few differences, but um, we'll just try and show off a few of the, the main things here. Um, so what do we got? Uh, here's the Federation bombers. We've got the uh, FB-111, the bomber variation of the F-111 fighter. Um, you can see that these guys and the, and the B-2s, they have these extra kind of big empty spaces down here. So these are internal bays that they can fill with a whole bunch of useful stuff. So um, depending on the bomber, it can be things like uh, mines, transporter bombs, or even uh, photon torpedo charges or extra drones. Usually you'll use them for extra drones or T-bombs, um, but it's a really cool thing that only the Federation bombers can use. And it's another thing that, that kind of they make use of and develop to get away from using the volatile PFs and sacrificing loads of pilots to that. So it's a pretty cool touch. Um, that only federations can make use of. Then we have a really good ship here for them, the light dreadnought carrier. So it's a it's a more modernized uh, light carrier, but very heavily armed because it is a dreadnought. You can see there's five photon torpedo launchers up front here, as well as a bunch of phaser ones. And then we've got a whole squadron of F-14Ds, which again is one of the best fighters in the game with the, the phaser uh, Gatling and a whole load of drones, plus the chaff pods. So this is a, a really threatening carrier to have on the board. Then we have um, the fast carrier, which is not so great in terms of the fighter complement. It's just the F-18C, but it's still a lot of drones you can put on the board. Um, the interdiction carrier, the CVD, is very useful, however, because this is the one that has the oversized squadron of 24. So if you include this in your battle force when you're building a scenario fleet, um, you can use these larger squadrons and the, the Federation can go over the typical limit for fighter deployment. So make sure you know which carriers have an oversized fighter complement and make use of those uh, to give you that advantage. And the patrol carrier as well has an oversized uh, squadron complement of 18 rather than 24. Um, but this one is, is more compact and certainly more vulnerable, not much in the way of weaponry on this guy. Then we've got a scout carrier. So it's got four special sensors and just uh, six heavy fighters, but these are the A-20Fs, the fast variant of the A-20, so they're really fast uh, for a heavy fighter at speed 15, and they have a good weaponry complement, so they've got two photon charges each, they've got a phaser 2 and a phaser 3, and you've got four uh, type 3 drone racks, you've got two chaff pods, and you've got six anti-drone charges, so to have six of those guys is, is really quite plenty uh, to, to threaten your opponents. Then we have... Uh, CVH strike carrier. This is a very common platform to use the F-111 fighter. Um, these guys, their main advantage is besides having these three internal bays, which I mentioned already, and having anti-drone rounds, uh, they can fire four drones in a turn. So that's really, really powerful. Um, it's double the throw rate of any other major fighter. So unless you're using remote control fighters and lots of special, you know, fairly rare uh, platforms, 
you know, these are going to be the best out there at putting lots of drones on the board. So, um, plus they have lots of HP, which is always useful. So, um, the CVH is a, is a very standard platform to get these guys to the battlefield. And it still has a decent amount of punch in that it has four photons to its name, um, as well as the six F-111s. And if you want to bring the F-111s on a tug or something like that, you can use these conveyor pods to bring them to the battlefield. And there's also the um, resupply ships to carry extra drones and stuff. And the, you have an auxiliary carrier for F-111s as well, which will be a bit cheaper um, than the more specialized F-111 carriers. So uh, I'm just going to buzz through the rest here. So we've got some more. Uh, we've got an auxiliary space control ship for the feds, which is a mixture of F-111s and F-18s. Um, then we have the uh, heavy and medium bomber squadrons for the feds, which again, you won't really use except in planetary defense, but they also have this internal bay system, which is really helpful for flexibility. Then we get to the Klingons. So we've got the area control ship showing up for them, which is a mixture of regular fighters and heavy fighters, which in these case have eight drone racks for each one, or rails rather, and four uh, disruptor charges. Then, you know, as with most of the races in this product, they get an interdiction carrier with 24 fighters and a patrol carrier with 18. Then we get um, scout carriers, we get escorts, um, resupply ships. So really, you know, if you pick up J2, you're getting a lot of new options with the heavy fighters and bombers for new kinds of scenarios. Um, but really you're getting a lot of great ships with utility for carrier-based campaigns um, that have mix, interesting mixes of fighters and new types of fighters. So. Like, for example, the uh, Romulan scout carrier introduces the Tribune F fighter, which has two uh, plasma F torpedoes and a lot more hit points. These are big old heavy fighters for the Romulans, which you won't find in Module J. Um, so if you really want to open up your fighter game, J2 is a good one to get. Um, you know, here we have bombers as well for the Romulans with lots of plasma F charges and a whole ton of hit points. Then the Gazintis with, you guessed it, introduction carrier, patrol carriers, uh, area control ship like the Klingons. So again, the heavy fighters and lighter fighters mixed together. Then we've got escorts, scout carrier. And with the Gorn, we have an emergency carrier with G12s. They get an interdiction carrier with 24 fighters and a patrol carrier with 18. I'm getting the theme now. We've got their heavy bombers. Uh, down here with a lot of uh, plasma D options for them um, and a heavy destroyer scout carrier which is pretty cool um, it has their version of the A20 with um, plasma F's and plasma D's then we get into our friends of the Tholians they have much more robust carriers in J2 so these are big old dreadnoughts um, they have lots of firepower they've got web generators uh, disruptors and they can carry a full squadron here of Spider 3s and Spider 2s. Likewise, we've got a Dreadnought Space Control ship for them. You can see it's got these tractor mech links here, which can carry six PFs as well. The Tholians have really good PFs, um, which are help compensate for their less excellent fighters. Um, but more on PFs when we eventually get to Module K. They have a War Cruiser carrier as well, which is a, a beefy machine. Uh, which carries a complement of Spider 3s and Spider 2s. Um, you'll notice that none of these so far have webcasters, though. They're just using regular web generators. Um, then we have a scout carrier, which has heavy fighters. These are the Spider 5s. Um, these are the best heavy fighters for the Tholians, these guys. So um, they've got a good speed at 15, decent cost at 28. They've got four disruptor charges, and they've got more hit points. So um, they, they are good value. Um, but unfortunately, in the SFU history, heavy fighters don't stick around that long before they get outshined by the PFs. But during that period, the Spider 5 is a really good one for the Tholians to build if you're doing a, a fighter-based campaign. Then we get some escorts and a Neotholian carrier. So here we finally get a carrier with webcaster functionality, which is fantastic. Um, Tholian fighters, as I said, are not that threatening, but if you have a bunch of them um, behind web and you've got your opponent stuck in that web, they can just pummel them with phaser after phaser after phaser, and they will not enjoy it at all. Then we get the Orions. In this case, they've got some Gladiator Ds on board, which they presumably purchased from the Romulans. And here we have a patrol carrier, which is instead using the ZYCs from the um, Klingons. 
and a scout carrier, which is using, what are those? I think those are the Kazinti, uh, yeah, LFS fighters. Yeah, those are Kazinti heavy fighters. Look at all those drones. So it looks like they've got 10 drone rails on each of those and four disruptor charges as well. Um, and here's a slaver light carrier, which is using Federation F-18Cs. You can see it's a much lighter platform here, not very heavily armed. Then we get to the Hydrons. Always fun for me. The Lord Executioner, we've got a whole bunch of Stinger 2s, as you can see. Then we've got some Stinger H's with Hellbores, uh, an, an EW fighter, and then we've got some heavies as well. Those are the Stinger T's, uh, very beefy with their Hellbore and Stinger char or and, uh, Fusion charges. We've got the Ragnar Cruiser as well, which has a bunch of Fusion beams up front, as well as having, um, looks like, what do we got? Three, six, nine, so 12. Uh, Stinger 2s and some Stinger H's mixed in there as well. Um, so, and it's got, of course, the typical phaser Gatlings and Fusions on board. Then we have the Sentinel Medium Scout Carrier here. This is mainly just phaser armed, uh, but it does bring some heavy, very scary Stinger T's. They've got two phaser Gatlings, by the way, these guys, as well as having a Hellbore Charge and four Fusion Charges. So not to be trifled with. Um, then we have the Pegasus Carriers, which are on the lighter side of things. And we have a, a training carrier. So this is a, a very small, lightly armed platform with Phaser 2s and uh, 10 Stinger 2s on board. And we have a light police carrier as well, um, which is very affordable, just 50 points, um, but can bring a full complement of Stinger 2s with it. Then we have our Andromedan mobile weapons platform. So you can bring um, 12 of these in the space of a satellite ship. And uh, they just have very simple couple of power absorber panels, a couple of hull points, uh, some warp, some battery, and some phaser twos. So they don't have any charges for heavy weapons. Um, but again, if you want to use fighters and PFs for the Andros, you really want to be looking at module C3A. Hopefully your opponent um, will let you use them. Then we have some stuff for the Lyrans. Again, they use Klingon fighters, um, ZYCs here, and they have the interdiction carrier and the patrol carrier. And they also have a medium carrier, um, which in this case gives them 12 ZYCs. They have a scout carrier with six heavy fighters. And then we've got the wind cluster with an escort war cruiser and an escort frigate. Then we get into the ISC with their interdiction carrier. And they have, as usual, a mixture of plasma D and plasma K armed fighters on board. Then, area control ship. So this one includes a uh, squadron of six heavy fighters. These are the HFFs. You can see they've got a couple of plasma F charges, as well as four plasma Ds and a lot more hit points. Then patrol carrier, a scout carrier, which again has a, a squadron of HFFs. The uh, fleet strike carrier. So this has a nice armament with uh, two forward-facing PPDs, which are always a threat from distance as well as having 12 fighters on board. The Light Fleet Carrier, which exchanges the PPDs for Plasma S, save you a lot of cost, um, but is less effective on its own without the fighters helping it. We have a small frigate carrier with FDF fighters. Then we have ISC bombers, sort of medium and heavy here, and they get uh, Plasma F charges. And then we have some generic yachts and heavy cargo shuttles. Then we have an LDR police carrier with six ZYC fighters, an escort for the LDR, and a couple of things for the Saltorians. Here we get an interdiction carrier, so they get 24 Klingon fighters on board, a area control ship that mixes in some heavy fighters, and the patrol carrier. Um, and finally, on the very back, we have the scout carrier with just a squadron of six heavy fighters. So that was a bit of a whirlwind tour of J2, but I hope it gives you the idea. Basically, it introduces many more options for carrying heavy fighters into battle. It brings in ground bases defending um, and bombers defending planets. There's some new rules to give you some more options with your fighters, and it really will kind of bring the full flex of the fighter game into SFB for you. Um, I think really just start with module J first and use the basic one space fighters and play the mini campaigns and stuff. And if you really want more options, then I would jump into J2. Now, just very briefly, if you are playing the Federation in particular and you want some good carriers, 
I would recommend that you look into R2. Now I recommended this already before. Um, you know, these are, are give you these R modules give you a lot more options for your favorite empires. But in particular, uh, if we look at the table of contents here, you look at all the stuff you get for the feds in here, um, and there are a lot of useful bits in here. So in particular, um, you have campaign useful stuff like fleet repair, fleet repair tug up on the top here. You've got different um, pods for PF tenders and so forth, battle pods, carrier pods to bring F-18s into the battle. Um, and you've got the space control ship, which is very useful um, and powerful machine. You get a bunch of F-18Cs and um, you get A-20s here and you get F-14Ds which are, as I keep saying, one of the best fighters in the game. Um, on top of that, you have the uh, a variant of the space control ship here. If you are using Federation PFs, then you'll use this version, which has PF mech links on it. Um, but it keeps the F-18s and the F-14Ds, but drops the heavy fighters. Then we get some more useful Federation stuff, battle cruisers, uh, drone cruisers... Uh, command cruisers, light tactical cruisers, I think. Um, yeah, here we go. This is the other one I wanted to point out to you. So the CVB strike carrier is one of the rare carriers for the Federation that allows you to bring F-15s to the fight. These are F-15Ds um, with your phaser Gs to the front and your multiple uh, racks of drones. They're very nimble and very effective fighters. So uh, if, you, if you're looking to have a, a mix of effective carrier possibilities to use for the federation of looking to r2 you know you then you've got an area control ship you've got this uh, strike carrier with f-15s you've got a few new options for f-14s um, and then you've got loads of just general useful stuff hospital ships and escorts and scouts and federation plasma ships minesweepers um, you know smaller carriers like this guy the escort carrier with f-18s so uh, it's a really really good module for the federation um, so highly recommended in that sense. Also, the new strike carrier is a good one with the full complement of F-18s. Um, and you'll find that there, there are good carriers for different empires kind of scattered throughout the different R modules, but they usually fit the general kind of theme. Um, so, for example, in R-11, you'll find that everybody gets division control ships, which have some PFs and some fighters on board. So if you do a bit of research before you buy your R modules, then you'll know kind of what fighter related or pf related stuff is in there for you finally uh one of the other modules that i recommend you know i really enjoy battleships in both starfleet battles and fc um, r5 is the main module for battleships but um, trickily this module r7 which is called dreadnoughts at war um, one of the great additions it makes to the game in my opinion is that it adds battleship carrier variants and stellar domination ships which are a lot of fun to play assuming that you like fighters and or pfs um, and you'll see that you get a lot of these. So for the Federation, you get a battleship carrier, two variants of the Stellar Domination ship, depending if you allow Federation PFs or not. Um, you've got heavy dread or heavy battleship carriers for the Klingons. I mean, loads of great stuff in here if you like the big boys. So just to show you here, um, yeah. So for the Federation, here is a BBV, the um, battleship carrier. And you can see, look at all the stuff we get here. We get uh, 12 A-10s complemented by 12 F-14s, which is a great mix, very powerful. And of course, it's a battleship, so it's extremely heavily armed. So you've got six photons up front, two more in the midsection here, loads of phasers everywhere. I mean, it's it's a beast. A lot of fun to play with. Um, the Stellar Domination ship takes the battleship and turns it into, um, well, there's two variants for the Federation. This one is when they're not using PFs and they have... In addition to the F-18s and F-14s here, they get a full squadron of A-20Fs, which are great heavy fighters. In the other variant, you get uh, instead these six PF mech links here, and you can use the Federation Thunderbolt PF ships along with this set of 24 very good fighters. Um, then, you know, you've got tons of big beasts here for the Klingons, but what's really exciting for the fighter people is the B-11V battleship carrier. And again, they also get a um, stellar domination ship. So this is an absolute beast, this guy. 400 points of death, um, plus six PFs, plus all these fighters. I mean, you really don't want to mess with these. 
And so it goes for the rest of the empires, um, and including you know the hydrons here. Here they get a uh, Monarch V heavy carrier, so this is a battleship carrier as well. And they have a stellar domination ship too. You get um, four different Andromedan Dominator variants, which are really beastly to fight against. Um, and then where are the, the Tholians get some good stuff in here too, if I can find it. Might be before the Hydrons. Yeah, so uh, the Tholians as well. They get a Neotholian battleship carrier, which is great um, because, you know, with all these fighters, 24 fighters, you also get webcaster capabilities. So you got a couple here, you got one up front, um, and you can really screw with people. <laughs> 392 points of Tholian phaser firepower coming through, you know, blockades of web, you know, multiplied by all these fighters you're adding to the mix. And then, of course, you have the Stellar Domination variant as well, which exchanges some of those fighters for 6 PFs, which makes it even worse because the Tholian Arachnid PFs are really great phaser boats for the price. Um, so, yeah, if you like big ships, you like big set-piece battles, and you like fighters and PFs, uh, make sure you look into R7 because you will get these battleship variants. And then, just as a final touch, if you really want to go nuts... Pick up a copy uh, on PDF of Starfleet Times number nine, which is in a comes in a five pack for five dollars. I think it's you know issues six through ten or something of Starfleet Times. In issue number nine, you will find the Federation CVN supercarrier, which carries seventy two fighters. Now this is a modernized version, which I had in my SFB archives. I looked it up. The original site where this SSD was hosted is gone. You may be able to find it on the web archive if you look for you know Federation CVN plus. Um, or poke around the ADB BBS where people are discussing new ship proposals and so forth. Um, it's a completely ridiculous ship. It's not designed to be balanced. It's designed to be fun. And it appeared in Starfleet Times initially, but was using kind of old variants of the Federation's kind of large ship structure. Um, so this modernized version just added in, you know, the, the kind of modern conveniences that we expect in Federation ships of this type. So it has, you know, G-Racks, that allow for, um, you know, anti-drone fire and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you get 72 fighters on this thing. <laughs> so you have 24 F-14s, uh, 24 F-18s, or no, 36 F-18s, actually. And you get then a dozen um, A-10s. And then you've got a full complement of advanced shuttles. You've got your regular admin shuttles, you got multi-role shuttles, and you've got SWACs as well. So uh, if you really just want to put an insane amount of drones on the board, I mean, look at all this stuff. Um, and just play like an entire week of Starfleet battles with just counters galore, uh, then you might want to use this guy. It, it is pretty crazy. I've Regretfully, I've not had the opportunity to play with this. Um, it's not actually even legal, I think, under the deployment restrictions because it has more than uh, 60 fighters just on one ship. But if there were some small changes made to the deployment restrictions in the S rules, then it would be possible to use this. But I don't know if anybody wants to go that far. Anyway, so I've been talking for way too long. Um, but hopefully that gives you an idea of what you're going to get. I personally think that I like having the option of playing with fighters or not. Not everybody's going to enjoy it. Um, I think it's great because, you know, I can, like I said, I view this as an alternative version of Star Trek. This is not supposed to be like a Star Trek from my screen. It's been extrapolated and expanded in a new direction with different empires that never appeared on the screen. So, of course, things are different, you know, and uh, we know that in later versions of the franchise, like in Deep Space Nine, the Federation certainly did use fighters uh, quite a bit in the Dominion War. So it's not beyond them to dive into using small, uh, more disposable and expendable attack craft. So, you know, suspend your disbelief, uh, fill the board with fighters and drones and have a good time in my book. Uh, it's good fun. And, you know, it is a lot of sort of bookkeeping and keeping track of stuff when you have a big carrier battle going on but it's something that everybody i think who tries as sfb should try at some point and the carrier campaign is a lot of fun as well to kind of you know try and keep your fighters alive and resupply and keep your you know fi uh, your fighter pilots gaining experience it's really cool and interesting take on the game so i recommend giving it a try um, if you find that you'd rather have you know more small ships duking it out then you may prefer using fast patrol ships in module k but, you know, for me, fighters are a little bit easier to handle, even though they do tend to fill the board with counters. Um, PFs do the same, and PFs need to do energy allocation and all kinds of other stuff too, uh, which fighters don't have to do. So I like fighters when I just want a big chaotic battle filled with just stuff happening. Things blowing up, 
drones hitting other drones, plasma out of nowhere, you know, just shrieking as things blow up and, and you know, realizing you made a terrible mistake as a whole wing of fighters goes down. It's, it's great fun. And, you know, if you can allow yourself to suspend disbelief and think that not everything needs to be like, uh, you know, what I saw on the TV and the movie screen with Star Trek, I can, I can, you know, enjoy this as an alternative take on Starfleet's principles and, and their military organization, then I think I'll have a good time with it. But I totally respect when people don't want to use these. And you can be perfectly happy playing Starfleet battles for years and never use any fighters. All these carriers and all the different products can be ignored. You can focus on nothing smaller than a frigate if you want, and, and the game works perfectly well that way. So it's entirely up to you. And that's one of the great things about the game system is that it is so expansive, it is so flexible. Um, there's just any different which way you want to play it, you can play it. And of course, if you if you want to tweak things about it, you can do that as well. Just as a final note, if you're a Federation Commander player and you've been watching this long, uh, first of all, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate your patience. Um, secondly, go to the ADB website and download Communique number 128 to get the latest draft fighter rules for the game. They are way, way, way simpler than what you get in SFB. Each race gets basically one type of fighter and that's it. They all cost the same, uh, 10 points each. They all have, you know, uh, much more limited abilities and they can only carry, you know, two drones, that kind of stuff. But they are going to bring out a fighter's attack module at some point. I've been campaigning for FC to include fighters for the Andromedans as well. So we'll see if that happens or not. I think it'd be great if they did because the Andromedan fighters are really unique. Um, and I will show them to you at some point when I manage to get new physical copies of Module K and Module C3A. I'll talk more about PFs and about the Andro stuff, so look forward to that. Anyway, so I hope that was helpful to some of you out there. If you have any more questions about fighters in SFB, um, or if you have any you know arguments you want to make for or against, feel free to, to shout it out down in the comments. Um, I find it a really interesting issue within the SFB community. Some people really don't like using fighters. Some people really love it. Um, I'm, I'm one of the few that's in between. I, I love them sometimes, but I don't need them in every game. So I'm really happy that they're there. And I do like sometimes having big chaotic fur balls on the hex map. It's just a lot of fun. Into the future, there's plenty more expansions to talk about. Uh, so look forward to that. Uh, in the meantime, stay healthy, happy, and well, as always. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. All right, take care and bye-bye.